I'm Sandra Jewell, and I'll be talking today about erythropoietin as a neuroprotective agent. A little bit different than the way that we normally use EPO. I have fin no financial uh, disclosures to make, but I do have to tell you that the use of EPO for neuroprotection is an off-label use. So the objectives uh, for this particular talk are to talk a little bit about brain injury in context. Um, in context of neurodevelopment and the situation that the baby is born in. We'll also talk about um, some different promising neuroprotective agents, um, what's in, what's not. Um, and then I will spend the rest of the time talking about EPO. Ah, okay. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, is the microphone working? No? Okay, well, I think it's on. For that? Yeah. Okay. Well, let me know if I need to speak louder. Um, so, uh, basically, my supposition <laughs> is that intervention can make a difference. <laughs> and here's some of the data why I believe that. So, if you look at global. Uh, mortality versus mortality in the U.S., you can see that um, while prematurity is basically the same, there is a very large difference in between mortality for sepsis and mortality for asphyxia in different places. And that's the result of the, the, the sorts of care that we have available in those different places. Hypoxia ischemia um, occurs in, a, if you look at the definition really is just hypoxia ischemia as opposed to neonatal encephalopathy. It's about 1.3 to 1.7 per thousand live births, or around 8,000 births per year in the United States. And that compares with 23% um, of neonatal deaths worldwide. And these pathologic specimens just give examples of what sort of injury we see um, as a result of hypoxia ischemia. So this is one group of babies that I think is really important to think about how we can help protect them from um, brain injury and death. And in fact, we do have one treatment, which is hypothermia, that has been proven to reduce um, the rate of death or moderate to severe disability. And this is one of those uh, cumulative studies looking at the major large trials and showing that there's definitely an improvement in death and morbidity by using hypothermia. Having said that, we still have a long ways to go. So um, this shows that if you meet criteria for steady entry, two-thirds of babies who are not cooled will die or have severe or moderate disability. With cooling, it's decreased to 44 to 55 percent, but clearly we have a long way to go. So what we're looking for now is something that we can add to <coughs> hypothermia to further improve the outcomes. But I think, again, we have to think about that in terms of uh, the context in which the brain injury occurs. And so there's sometimes when we know that the injury is acute, perhaps a cord accident or placental <coughs> abruption versus more chronic uh, in utero hypoxia. And we have to take into consideration the stage of brain development in which the uh, injury occurs. So preterm brain injury is quite different from injury in a term infant. And then um, infection also affects the outcome very significantly. So uh, just to think a little bit about cortical development, um, if you think at the beginning of brain, in, of, uh, <coughs> brain development, there's pluripotent stem cells that uh, live in the ventricular zone and the subventricular zone. These give rise to radial glial cells, which then migrate out and become both excitatory interneurons, inhibitory interneurons, and pyramidal neurons. This is uh, an example of the structure of an 11-week human fetus. After the neurons are born, then astrocytes develop and oligodendrocytes develop even after that. And this is one of the reasons why preterm babies are so 
um, susceptible to white matter injury is because the pre-oligodendrocytes are quite um, vulnerable to oxidative injury. And then during the period that these babies live in our intensive care units, synaptogenesis is going on. And neurons that connect well uh, have a higher incidence of survival as, as comparison to those that don't make good synaptic connections and they uh, undergo programmed cell death. So that all is going on. Um, here's some images from MRI, and this goes from 26.7 weeks gestation to 35.7 weeks gestation. And I just find this really incredible that so much <coughs> brain development is going on during the time that we're taking care of these babies. So it's easy to think that some of the things that we do with the care of these babies will influence this brain development. So that's preterm development. Um, for hypoxia ischemia, the mechanism of injury is a little bit more clear. So if you have a lack of, of oxygen, then oxidative phosphorylation is inhibited. That results in energy depletion because there's less ATP being made. That results in ion pumps uh, stopping working. So um, calcium influxes into the cells, the cell swells and, and um, burst, basically. So glutamate is released. Glutamate is excitotoxic. Um, more cells die, and you end up with a combination of apoptosis and necrosis. Infection also um, very significantly affects how vulnerable the babies are to hypoxia ischemia. And as we all know, infection is fairly common, particularly for our preterm babies. Um, and here's just a few studies that I pulled out showing um, very significant risk of uh, intrapartum asphyxia in, in the context of infection. So to summarize, um, there's selective vulnerability of both um, cell types, and we talked a little bit about oligodendrocytes already. There's also a switch in the way um, uh, uh, transmission occurs. So early on in gestation, actually, GABA receptor stimulation results in, in stimulation, whereas later on, um, after term, it's actually uh, GABAergic cells are inhibitory. So we have to take that into consideration in the drugs we use. The regions of brain that are at risk are different in term and preterm babies. So preterm babies most often have white matter injury, whereas term, inju term babies most often have gray matter injury. And then there's the timing of injury. And, um, and <coughs> for example, early microglial influx is thought to be inflammatory and harmful, whereas later uh, um, microglia influx has a big piece in, in um, healing and recovery from brain injury. So all of these things have to be taken into context and consideration. So this is the GABA switch that I was talking about. So early on in development, um, GABA um, receptor stimulation is, is ex excitatory. And then there's a developmental increase in um, this co-transporter expression. Um, which results in um, uh, extruding chloride from the cell. So in rats that occurs, um, that becomes mature in the second postnatal week, and in humans that occurs around 30 weeks gestation. So that's when the GABA switch occurs. So if you give um, GABAergic drugs before 30 weeks gestation, it can be st excitatory, stimulatory instead of inhibitory. So that's one of our issues that we'll talk about with, um, with sedation. So for neuroprotective intervention, the ideal treatment would be safe. We talked about safety as a big issue. Should be readily available, inexpensive, easy to administer, should either prevent injury, ideally, if you're talking about preterm in, uh, infants, or for term infants, after an injury um, has occurred, it would be effective um, once you know that the injury has occurred, and it would affect all the cells that are at risk, reduce inflammation, reduce cell death, and ultimately improve outcome. So that's our ideal intervention. 
We talked a little bit about hypothermia being our only treatment that's available, and right now we only use that for term or near-term babies. It's not really um, appropriate for preterm babies at this point. Um, these are some of the mechanisms by which hypothermia works. It decreases cerebral metabolism, slows cell depolarization, prevents ATP depletion, reduces the accumulation of excitotoxic neurotransmitters, which then goes on to uh, stimulate um, neuronal death. It also preserves the blood-brain barrier and decreases oxidative injury. And we have both um, animals um, in vitro and in vivo data to support this. We know in, uh, from animal studies that there's a very um, reliable unfolding of events after an acute injury, and this is illustrated here. So within minutes, there's an increase in glutamine, calcium, um, and excitotoxicity that occurs. Then there's an ongoing inflammatory response that results in programmed cell death. And then at several days or weeks after an event, there's a healing process that occurs that um, includes both neurogenesis and angiogenesis. So if we think about ways that we can intervene, um, some strategies that have been looked at include um, trying to interrupt excitotoxicity or interrupting the inflammatory process using um, anti-inflammatory agents and anti-apoptotic agents. And then finally, people are now starting to think about maybe a later intervention might also be important in, in brain repair. So some of the promising therapies that are being worked on uh, in labs across the country include xenon, uh, which is a noble gas. It interacts with the NMDA receptor, so three xenon molecules interact at the active site of the NMDA receptor. <coughs> This therapy is limited, though, because it's an inhaled gas, and it requires about 50 percent, 30 to 50 percent of inhaled gas, so you can only use it in babies that are in 50 percent oxygen or less. Um, so that's one limitation. The other thing is that um, it's actually quite difficult to administer. There's a, um, a machine that's used uh, to administer and then recapture the xenon because xenon is quite expensive and so it can only be used in specialized units that have that equipment. Um, mm -hmm. One good thing about it is that it crosses the placenta so if you know that there's a baby at risk then you could use it as anesthesia for the mother while you're doing a c-section on the mom and start the neuroprotection early on. There are clinical trials that are ongoing now in England, two that I know of, um, and there's quite a bit of uh, very promising preclinical data in piglets that uh, Mariana Thorson has um, published. So, so stay tuned. There's more information coming on this. Another uh, promising neuroprotective agent is melatonin. Um, this is FDA approved. It does cross the placenta. So like xenon, it could be used um, prenatally if you know that the baby is at risk. It works through um, specific melatonin receptors, and it has antioxidant and anti-apoptotic effects. And again, there are, uh, there's uh, at least one clinical trial that I know of that is ongoing. Stem cells is something people talk about a lot as a promising new therapy. Um, this is one therapy I think that the, the horse got out of the barn a little bit early. There's very little in terms of preclinical data supporting its use for hypoxia ischemia or for use in preterm infants, um, but there's a lot of excitement. But unfortunately, we still don't know which cells are the best, what's the best time to give it, whether you can use it with hypothermia or not. Um, and very significantly, we really don't know the long-term or even the short-term uh, safety profile for, for using uh, stem cells. So for this one, I would say um, very strongly that m animal studies are needed before we go into the human arena. Um, so now we turn to erythropoietin, my favorite um, growth factor. So EPO is produced in the kidney postnatally. It's prenatally, it's produced in the liver. 
and it regulates erythropoiesis. That's the main <coughs> function of EPO. Um, it works through um, JAK stat signaling, and it blocks apoptosis of erythrocyte precursors. So when I first um, started learning about EPO, um, I was very interested to see in 1993 there was a paper published saying the EPO receptors were expressed on mouse neurons and that it had trophic effects in, in mouse neurons. So um, I was just very curious about that and was wondering if, if that was true in humans and that was sort of the start of my interest in this area. This is a, a summarizing figure that was published in Brain Research. It basically shows um, EPO producing cells. Um, so EPO is produced in the brain by astrocytes primarily. And EPO receptors are present in neurons, astrocytes, endothelial cells, and microglia. So there's an endogenous system at work, but you can also give EPO exogenously. However, it whatever form it comes in, it works in a, um, uh, with its cognate uh, receptor, dimerizes, and then there's several pathways by which EPO works. So JAK2, STAT5, it works through the NF-kappa B system and also PI3 kinase to have its effects. And this just summarizes some of the effects that have been found both in vivo and in vitro in animal uh, work. So it works as a growth factor to increase neurogenesis. It increases glial cell proliferation, angiogenesis, and it improves oligodendrocyte maturation. And then as a uh, protective effects, it decreases um, neuronal apoptosis after an acute injury. It decreases oligodendrocyte injury, which might be important for white matter injury decreases inflammation and oxidative injury, as well as nitric oxide toxicity and glutamate toxicity. So it attacks the brain injury, mechanisms of brain injury by several different methods. And this summarizes that. So there's acute effects that include anti-inflammation, anti-apoptosis, and glutamate toxicity. This results in improved cell survival acutely and then EPO also has long-term effects, improving um, neurogenesis, vasculogenesis, and then it also has erythropoietic effects, um, which one of the things that that does is it increases iron utilization and potentially through that mechanism also decreases oxidative injury. So in thinking about this, how do we move EPO from the bench to the bedside? One of our first questions was, does it get across the blood-brain barrier? Because as neonatologists, it's really unlikely we're going to give intrathecal injections of EPO to babies. So we did this experiment in non-human primates. We gave either um, IV EPO or intra, uh, intraperitoneal uh, EPO and measured the serum levels, and then we measured uh, spinal fluid levels <coughs> over time in these same animals. And what you can see is that EPO clearly goes up after injection, but very, very small fraction of EPO gets in. So if you look at the um, y-axis here, this is in milliunits per ml, so this is 80,000. This is milliunits per ml, and this is 200 here. So a very small percentage gets in, which is the reason why high-dose EPO is um, recommended for EPO neuroprotection. So it does have um, and, uh, uh, protective effects in brain injury. This is the Venucci model of brain injury in which you ligate one carotid artery and then expose the animal to 8% oxygen. And this is a typical um, brain injury that you see in an animal. Um, this here is basically a big infarction on the side of the carotid artery ligation, whereas that's a normal brain. So just to summarize the literature, in, in um, these rodent models of brain injury, using um, what's now thought to be effective doses of EPO, you get between a 40 and 80 percent decrease in the size of infarction. And we've also seen that multiple doses of EPO work better than single doses of EPO. 
So um, to try and define what sort of course would give optimal <coughs> neuroprotection, protection, um, we looked at this unilateral brain injury that I just um, told you about and uh, compared EPO to saline. We used one, three, or seven daily doses and three different dosing um, schemas, so 2,500 units, 5,000, or 30,000 units per kilo. And then we looked at the brains either two days later or one week later, and we assessed um, gross brain injury, gliosis, or apoptosis in these animals. And what we found was that um, by all parameters that we looked at, um, the 5,000 unit for three doses had better outcomes than the lower doses or even the high dose of 30,000 units per kilo. In looking at some of the mechanisms of EPO um, neuroprotection, we did some um, microarray ex um, experiments in which we looked at animals that were sham injured. So this is basically normal gene expression for this particular family of uh, inflammatory genes. This is an animal that had brain injury but received placebo, <coughs> and you can see there's this huge upregulation of genes. So I should tell you that each column here is one animal, and each um, row is one gene in this family of, of gene expression. So each animal here had this very significant upregulation of inflammatory gene expression. And these animals that received EPO um, looked much more like the control animals. Similar experiments looking at um, specific inflammatory mediators and apoptotic enzymes, just showing that it does have acute effects on these um, um, pathways. <coughs> We also looked at long-term neurocognitive development in these uh, neonatal animals that had received EPO or not. Um, this particular paradigm was looking at whether animals remember um, to, uh, this is a passive avoidance test, so the animals are put in a, a light room. They like to go into the dark, but on the first day, if they go into the dark room, they get a shock. So on the second day, what we measure is how long they stay in the light room, if they remember that going into the dark room is a bad thing. So the uninjured, uninjured animals remember quite well not to go in here. The uh, EPO animals remember um, fairly well, and the, the um, brain-injured saline-treated animals um, don't remember. So to summarize, EPO does cross the blood-brain barrier, gets into the CSF and brain, decreases inflammation and apoptosis, protects neurons and decreases <coughs> structural brain injury, it reduces learning impairment due to brain injury, and it's dose-dependent. And in experiments I haven't shown you, we've shown that it is safe in animals if you give it to newborns <laughs> and look at um, several measures of, of organ function, um, it's safe in, a, in the adults. So there are some prospective clinical trials that are just beginning to um, be published. This is one that actually is just hot off the press. It's a, a, called the NEAT trial, and it's a um, phase one, two trial of high-dose EPO in term babies with uh, hypoxia ischemia. So the objectives of this trial was to determine safety and pharmacokinetics of high-dose EPO given in conjunction with hypothermia. And we wanted to look at um, which dose of EPO would produce <coughs> levels that were comparable to what we know are neuroprotective levels in uh, rodent models. So it's a dose escalation open label trial. 24 infants were enrolled. And three babies got 250 units. Six babies got 500 units. Seven babies got 1,000 units. And eight babies got 2,500 units. They got up to six doses of EPO starting at less than 24 hours of age. Is it mature These are term babies. term babies. Yeah, they basically um, would qualify for <coughs> any of the hypothermia trials. And I'll show you some of the data for their entry criteria in a moment. So they were all encephalopathic, 
And um, here are some of the clinical characteristics of the babies. So 58% had five-minute APGARs less than three, 25% uh, percent had 10-minute APGARs less than three, and here are their initial um, pHs. So they were, they qualified clinically as having um, neonatal encephalopathy. Um, so they were, these were babies admitted to four different units. It was a multi-center trial and, um, and cooled. And then within the first 24 hours of life, they were enrolled in this study. We found no deaths, um, no significant adverse events. And um, the FDA was very concerned about polycythemia in these babies because the doses was, was quite high. And in adults, that's a very um, uh, high risk thing. These babies had a median of minus 14 uh, point drop in their hematocrit because, of course, we phlebotomized these babies. And so um, it wasn't a big surprise to us. So we looked at um, cool cap morbidities as our um, proxy for a control group since this was a phase one trial. Um, and this is um, EPO plus hypothermia in our group. These are the side effects that we saw <coughs> comparing to cool cap side effects. Um, and basically, there was no difference in any of these um, adverse events that are associated with hypoxia ischemia. So these are our pharmacokinetic profiles at the different doses. So the 250 dose gave very uh, low levels of EPO. The 2,500 dose gave um, pretty significant uh, levels of EPO. There was no accumulation over time. So these are the, um, the first dose of EPO and then the last dose of EPO. These are what's considered to be <coughs> neuroprotective doses in, in mice and rats. Anything between 6 and 15,000 units per ml is neuroprotective. And if you look at uh, the pharmacokinetics, first of all, it's nonlinear. And this has been shown before in both humans, non-human primates, different animal models. So this is no different. And what that means is if you look at 250 and a tenfold increase in that, there's more than a tenfold increase in the area under the curve. And also, the, um, the half-life increases with increasing doses. Now, interestingly, um, we have done a similar phase 1-2 trial in preterm infants using similar doses. And the, um, the levels that we found in the term infants were higher than in the preterm infants. So that was a little bit surprising. We had assumed that the metabolism would be faster in the term infants. And we're not sure why this is. It may be that they were asphyxiated, or it may be that they were cooled, and that decreased the clearance. Um, so the half-life was two to two and a half times longer in these term asphyxiated babies than in preterm babies. But even with that, there was no excessive accumulation. So um, in rodents, 5,000 units per kilo for three doses uh, affords the maximal effect. The area under the curve for this dose is around 117,000. <coughs> and that compares to 1,000 units per kilo in the neonates. So we felt that the 500 unit per kilo dose was too low, and the, five, and the 2,500 overshot the optimal range by about threefold. So for studies that we're, we're moving forward with, we're choosing 1,000 units per kilo as our optimal dose. The babies in this study did get uh, MRIs, and 54% uh, were normal compared to um, 4% that had basal ganglia injury and 42% that had uh, watershed injuries. Limitations of the study. So glad I put this slide in. Um, it was a very small phase one trial, basically, and there's no long-term outcome data for these babies, and there's no control group in the babies. Um, we were using the cool cap trial uh, outcomes as our proxy for a control group. 
And the head MRIs were done at different times with different protocols since they were done at four different centers. So there is um, a <coughs> trial that has been published of EPO for um, HIE. This was published out of China in 2009. 83 babies received <coughs> EPO compared to 84 babies that received conventional <coughs> therapy. This was before hypothermia was used um, at this particular site. Um, so it was EPO compared to control. There was no hypothermia involved. Um, some of the babies got 300 units per kilo. Some of the babies got 500 units per kilo. They got seven doses every other day. And they, their results um, showed that the um, neurologic exam based on the Thompson score was improved at one week, two weeks, and four weeks. They had decreased disability with the moderate HIE group. And that was defined by uh, MDI scores below 70 and CP at 18 months. So overall, death or disability at 18 months was 44% in the control group and 25% in the EPO group. Now having said this, there were many methodologic flaws in this trial. I'm not sure that um, it was properly controlled for. Um, there was no intention to treat. So, I mean, the, but it's, it's the only, um, it's the first study that's out there. So, this is another um, pilot trial that's been published in term babies with HIE. Again, a very small trial, 45 babies in three groups. So, they had 15 healthy term babies, 15 babies with moderate or mild to moderate HIE that got EPO, and 15 babies that got no EPO. They measured um, circulating nitric oxide in these babies and showed in general that the babies that had HIE had higher levels of nitric oxide um, and EPO tended to decrease that. They looked at EEGs on these babies um, and um, showed an improvement in the, the background of these EEGs in the EPO treated babies. They didn't see any difference in the MRIs of the babies, um, but at six months, which is a very short follow-up period, the EPO babies seem to be doing better. There are risks of EPO, and uh, in adults, EPO has been shown to cause hypertension, increased risk of clotting, polycythemia. There were reports for a while of uh, red blood cell aplasia. Um, in certain groups of adult patients, it's been associated with uh, cardiovascular problems, um, DVTs, increased death. Um, so it's potentially not a benign treatment. Fortunately, in babies, none of these um, side effects have been reported. And so I think it's reasonable to move forward with clinical trials at this point. Um, I think for preemies, we have to think about the risk of retinopathy of prematurity and hemangiomas, um, since that's, uh, you know, the retinas are still developing and EPO clearly has vasculogenic effects. So um, there are several trials that are planned. Um, the NEAT 2 trial, which is the follow up of the phase one trial that I just told you about is in the planning stage. We're looking for money for that. Um, there's another phase one trial of Darby Potent, which is a larger um, uh, erythropoietic agent. Um, so they'll be doing a pharmacokinetic uh, study of Darby Potent in babies who have HIE. There's an ongoing stroke, uh, stroke study uh, in the Netherlands uh, headed by Frank van Bell. And then for preterm infants, there's a Swiss trial that's ongoing looking at uh, three doses of high-dose EPO in babies less than 32 weeks gestation. And we are planning um, a peanut trial for babies that are less than 28 weeks gestation, looking at high-dose EPO followed by maintenance EPO up to 32 weeks gestation. So stay tuned. Over the next five years or so, we should be getting much more information uh, about this. And as always, um, there's many people to thank, um, including the funding agencies that make this all possible. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions.
1,000 units per kilo, I think, is what we believe is the optimal uh, dose. For, it, depends on, it depends on whether you're talking about acute brain injury or preterm brain injury. Mm. So for, for <coughs> hypoxia ischemia, where we think it's an acute injury, um, we're planning on giving six doses of 1,000 units per kilo every other day. Um, for preterm injury, where it's, it's not an acute event, it's these babies are at risk for the period of oligodendrocyte vulnerability, we're planning on giving six doses of 1,000 units per kilo every other day, followed by 400 units per kilo three times a week until 32 weeks gestation. <coughs> mm -hmm. How early is this talking about in preemies? And how early versus saturated? How long? How early? How early? For neuroprotection? Yeah. Um, so both trials will enroll babies by 24 hours. Mm. Are there differences between preterm babies and term babies when deciding when to how early to start? Well, so um, the highest risk period for preterm babies is the first week of life because that's when you're at risk for intraventricular hemorrhage. Um, but I think you're, you're still at risk while your oligodendrocytes are developing. And, and we know, for example, that babies who have necrotizing enterocolitis or sepsis or BPD have worse outcomes than babies who don't have those things. Um, so I think it's important to start within the first week of life, but I think um, thinking that just giving three doses in the first week of life is probably not optimal given the ongoing risk. Um, whereas for term babies, you know, something's happened and then they need to repair the brain after that has occurred, and so there's no ongoing risk. So I think it is a different thought process. Mm -hmm. We're having a low white blood cell count in this uh, at all. Mm -mm. So that so that the the thought about neutropenia, neutropenia. and and EPO yeah. came from some early rat studies, studies that were done in in uh, rat pups. They did have neutropenia, but in all the studies that have been done in humans, that's never been shown to be an issue. But we still keep it. So for our, um, it, for both the studies, neutropenia is a stopping event. It's just we don't anticipate that that that'll happen. But. Mm -hmm. What might be sort of an explanation that you don't see the side effects <coughs> in preterm infants compared to the side effects in adults? Well. Um, so in adults, polycythemia is a real thing, um, and I think if you're polycythemic, it, you are at higher risk for DVT, and um, many of the side effects probably go along with that. And I mean, infants are already, sort of, they are preterm, they are already very polycythemic compared to adults. But the whole clotting cascade is different in in newborns, <clears throat> the balance is quite different in newborns compared to adults. And we, so in the United States, the <coughs> average phlebotomy loss for uh, preterm babies is 80 cc's. I think you do better in Europe. It's about 40 cc's in most uh, mm -hmm. European countries. But basically the range for us is half a blood volume to three blood volumes is blood, the amount of blood we phlebotomize over the first four to six weeks of life. So, I mean, polycythemia just isn't an issue. Anemia is our issue in, in neonates. So, um, and the balance of the clotting cascade is quite different. So I, I think it's, it's just a different population. Um, there's so many things that are different about babies. It's hard to say exactly one thing that causes the difference in um, adverse outcomes. Um, I think that the word apoptosis, it sounds terrible, but we know that apoptosis is actually a normal process in mm -hmm. brain development and it's probably important to eliminate also tissue mm -hmm. that is not going to function normally. 
there any concern if you treat a baby with a drug which is blocking apoptosis and at the same time is a baby which is not very sick? If you can block the normal apoptosis which is going on in every brain mm -hmm. in development? Yes. That's the reason that it's important to do a two-tailed test. I'm so glad you gave your talk yes. first. So, no, th th because it is a concern. I mean, we think that this treatment will have benefit, but it's certainly possible that it will have harm. And so that's the reason that you do the long-term outcome follow-up. So, and that's the reason we have DSMBs, and, y you know, so it'll be very carefully monitored over um, the course of this study. But it's definitely a possibility. I mean, program cell death is an important part of brain development. So, <coughs> in, in the peanuts trials, uh, the 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 gene is going to be given only in the first week of life. No, in the peanut trial, that so the peanut trial is the preterm trial, yeah. and those babies will get six doses in the first two weeks of life, followed by 400 units per kilo three times a week until 32 weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's a long-term study. But I mean, that's basically an erythropoietic dose. We have a lot of studies looking at EPO in randomized controlled trials, and EPO is safe at that dose. So Robin Oles actually is now doing um, the BRIGHT trial, and she just uh, had a um, presentation at PAS showing that she's looking at the neurodevelopment of babies mm -hmm who have received either EPO or Darby Poetin versus yeah. placebo, and their outcomes are uh, better, even just getting the 400 units per kilo in these preemies. Their uh, MDI scores are about 10 points better. It's pretty significant, so. Yeah. Yeah. Just when you thought about that design, um, the, the question is why uh, use it during that length of time? Um, if you believe that exposing the baby let's say within the first two weeks of life where all those bad events occur, you might already, you, you might, ex that the exposure to erythropoietin might already show a, a different a benefit uh, for those bad outcomes and, and for better development outcome. Um, why not a shorter versus a long term mm -hmm. where it could have more side effects? I mean, mm -hmm. how, how did, what was the thought process in, in deciding that you're going to give it all to the 32 weeks? So one issue that I think um, was very important to us in the decision making was that these preemies are at risk for until at least they're 32 weeks. So that's based on Stephen Bach's data of the pre-oligodendrocyte being at, at risk um, from 24 to 32 weeks gestation. And we know that EPO actually has protective effects on oligodendrocytes. So that was one thing. Um, the other thing is just the knowledge um, that preterm, so their babies are at higher risk in the first week of life, um, but they continue to be at risk. And so um, we thought that a more prolonged period of EPO would have more robust protection. In our first iteration of this study, we actually had three arms of the study um, with acute EPO. EPO with maintenance and no EPO, but um, our reviewers um, basically said, just just do two arms, just you know decide on one dose, and so that's what we have gone with. It, it is wiser to make it simpler to get you know more concrete results. Sometimes you branch them out, and you don't get good results on any of the arms, and you lose the effect that you'd like to, right. to, to do. So the other question. Um, yeah, so, so you will um, be looking, of course, at the, the, the biggest concern, of course, is ROP. Yes. And, and, um, but that has not shown to be very significant in already, you know, with all the experience. How long have we been using Ecogen now since the 1990s? Yes, it's over 25 years. Yes, so and, and no randomized controlled trial has shown that EPO increases ROP. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the Swiss trial, they've, um, their DSMB is looking very carefully at this. Um, and um, in their, uh, I think they've, in their halfway 
um, look at the data, the EPO treated babies had an ROP incidence of 7.8 percent and the control group was 8 percent. So no difference between the groups. So. And the last question I had was, uh, there are other factors that have been looked at, uh, um, prenatal that can affect developmental outcome and factors associated with the increased cytokine. Um, and, and so epigen is affecting also NF-kappa beta and, and, and imagine suppressing uh, that pathway to increase cytokine. Is that, is that, am I correct? Mm -hmm. And so you, are you categorizing these babies where if they had chorionitis? Yeah. So part of the study will include um, all babies will get a baseline head ultrasound to make sure um, we know whether or not they have bleeds before they get, I mean, it doesn't affect their randomization, but at least we'll know because I think a lot of the studies that have been done, if you don't have that information just by chance, even with large studies, you can, for whatever reason, get a higher number of bleeds in one group than another, and that affects the outcome. So um, babies will get a head ultrasound prior to getting their first dose of EPO. They'll also have baseline bloods drawn with the EPO levels, which I think reflects intrauterine hypoxia. And they'll also have inflammatory mediators measured. And then they'll have sequential inflammatory mediators measured so that we know whether or not EPO actually does decrease these inflammatory mediators in human preterm infants. Um, so we, we hope to have the answer to that question. You had a question? <coughs> isn't the, what the, um, just asking, how is the EPO being given? It's IM, isn't it? So for the first six doses will be IV, and then the later doses will be sub-Q, right. and the control group will not have shots. So, so in the they'll have sham injections. So the screen goes up around the babies. They will actually have a syringe come up from pharmacy that contains saline, but they won't actually get a shot. They'll just get a band aid. So hopefully, we'll maintain blindness for all the caretakers. Was it always given IV? Because I no. just remember it being given IM and the and sub the yeah, sub always sub and the and the real criticism was the pain of the, the injections increasing the risk of IVH in the preterm babies as noxious stimulus being given. But I don't think there's I, I'm unaware of any so. studies that show <coughs> EPO being associated with IVH. It was just the it was just the thought that ah, doing yeah. something really nasty. Yeah, so the babies will get IV, EPO to start with, and then they'll get, they'll get the sub-Q shots. The babies that actually get EPO will get sub-Q shots. So it's randomized, they the No, so once you have consent, then the babies will get a head ultrasound. Once you have consent, they get randomized. The ultrasound has nothing to do with the randomization. That data just gets stored, and so then when we go back to analyze the data, we will know who had a, a bleed before they got EPO. So it doesn't affect the randomization. That would be not good. <laughs> so, so do you, sorry, do you have to have a third group, as we've heard this morning, of people that don't consent to go into the study outcomes for those trends to show that nothing's changing during your... Yeah, I guess that would just be the Vermont-Oxford network. I mean, the data yes. that we collect... Um, things change when yeah. you do a study. I mean, right. you need things to stop. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Are protocols the same? Administration of Oh, you ask the nitty-gritty. Yeah. So I have torn my hair out out of that one. So... Um, so in the original version, the, uh, there is an iron guideline that goes with this study. Um, and the way I had it set up, the control babies got half the iron that the EPO babies got. And, but everybody got iron so that you could blind the, um, that piece as well, because otherwise people would say, oh, that baby got iron. He must be on the EPO arm. Um, 
And then I talked to our pharmacist who said, well, then you have to, you know, pay money for each dose of iron every day for these preemies who, you know, it's a many week study. So we've ended up saying that all babies will get iron. Um, when they start eating, they'll get three milligrams per kilo. When they reach 60 milligram, 60 <coughs> mils per kilo of enteral feeds, they go to six milligrams per kilo when they get to 120 mils per kilo, and everybody gets that. So that's not randomized. And <coughs> the, each center has to buy into doing that. So you're asking good questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's it's more of an issue, I think, with the IV iron, and so uh, because people in general, I think, are willing to give six milligrams per kilo of enteral iron, because you either absorb it or not. Um, but the IV iron is a bigger issue for the. There's a very small percentage of these babies that will will not be taking enteral feeds and so for them we've said they'll get one and a half milligrams IV per week and some people are like oh that's not enough you should be giving you know one milligram a day or and then there's other people like you need five milligrams per week what are you thinking so I I've tried to just uh, compromise and come up with something that's reasonable mm -hmm. Is there any new information about the experimental fund? I will actually that? talk about that in my talk tomorrow. Um, but um, yeah, so so the new information that I learned at PAS, this is not published data, but um, several groups. So Alistair Gunn has done some work with sheep, and Nikki Robertson has done some work with piglets, and we've done some work with non-human primates in my lab. And actually, it looks like it can be quite harmful in neonates. So we all went into it thinking, oh, it's great. You know, there's the NENS trial and, and um, dexmedetomidine. Is that, that what you were? Oh, dexmedetomidine. Sorry, I was answering a different question. It's a caffeine. Yeah, no, no, no. I don't know anything about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> We aren't controlling for that. We are just recording it. And one of my sub-hypotheses is babies may do better because they're not transfused as much. Yes, well, that's the whole issue. So you can go to any instance of neck association. Right. Right. So we'll, we'll just be keeping track of that. So, it's like, so the adverse outcomes, retinopathy, so we have a set of EPO-related adverse outcomes, which include death, um, stroke, um, seizures, all those bad things, clotting. Um, and then we have a set of adverse outcomes that are basically preemie problems, um, ROP, BPD, neck, sepsis, early and late. Um, IVH, hydrocephalus, um, PVL, and then we just look at the incidence of those and compare them. And then, yeah. Are any of you on my study section? Or just <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, thank you.